was in a, um, I was walking with my son in, in Target and we were, you know, I had a cart and he just told me, mommy, look at this. He was showing me something. So I turned around for like, I don't know, even five seconds maybe. And by that time, a woman with um, her, she was, she had a stroller. She walked past me and I almost hit her. I didn't, I didn't even come close to her, but I almost did. And I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. And she just looked at me so harshly and gave me that like, like, you know, dis look of disgust. And I was like, oh my God, it was like the most innocent thing. And it was like five seconds, but you could tell like she was just so angry. So you have a lot of angry people out there and uh, you know, all the blah, blah, but the point being is, you know, we have these different aspects to our being and, you know, in our faith, we don't believe that, um, we believe that, you know, that the intellect has to be um, nurtured. It has to be, uh, you know, um, it, it can overcome, right? If you, with knowledge, with, as they say, knowledge is power, right? With knowledge, with proper understanding, you can overcome both your appetitive and your irascible souls and, and have proper, you know, and conduct. I mean, you can have people who are civilized and actually conducting themselves uh, the proper way, but that needs to be nurtured. And so we don't have this idea of, um, of original sin, but we do have the responsibility is on uh, parents of children to be able to give them this, these tools, right? So that they can overcome their nefs. Otherwise, what do you have? You have, um, you know, if you, if you don't teach a child to restrain themselves, you don't teach a child to not give in to every impulse or every desire, they become very dangerous as adults, right? And this is, again, the world that we live in. You have a lot of, unfortunately, people who did not have parenting. They did not have tarbiya. They did not have a parent or, or anyone really present to be able to teach them how to practice restraint, how not to say whatever's on your mind. You know, there's a lot of this, um, you know, these notions in our society to just speak freely, say whatever you want, do whatever you want, you know, give in to every desire, every whim. Um, and this is now normal. That's the normal message. If you, if you practice abstinence, for example, I mean, I, I work with youth all the time and I hear this all the time. If you're abstinent from certain behaviors in this society, you're considered the strange one, right? You're considered, you know, weird. Yeah, prude, prudish, or they're square, right? There's something wrong with you. And that's why peer pressure is real, right? It's a very real thing. That's why a lot of teens are afraid to disclose, and specifically teens of with a faith background. Uh, there, there's immense pressure not to talk about their faith openly because the backlash will be so severe. You know, you'll be ostracized, you'll be made to feel like there's something wrong with you. So this is because the predominant culture believes that you should just give in to whatever you want to do all the time, whereas our faith is all about teaching restraint. I mean, subhanAllah, so much of what we do is to inculcate restraint, you know. And so it's a very important um, quality to have. So, alhamdulillah, then he, um, goes on to say, we're almost done with this. He says on page eight, if you're, if you're reading along, this matter relates to the fact that the heart is a spiritual organ. The unseen aspect of the heart contains a bad seed that has the potential of becoming like a cancer that can meta metastasize and overtake the heart. The bacterium responsible for tuberculosis, for example, lives latent in the lungs of millions of people. When its carriers age or succumb to another disease that weakens their immune system, tuberculosis may start to emerge. This analogy illustrates that there is a dormant element in the human heart that, if nurtured and allowed to grow, can damage the soul and eventually destroy it. The Prophet ﷺ stated, if the son of Adam sins, a black spot appears in the heart, and if the person repents, it is erased. But if he does not, it continues to grow until the whole heart becomes pitch black. Incidentally, this notion of associating the color black with sin is not racist in its origins. This attribution has been long used even among black Africans 
who refer to a person who is wretched as black-hearted. The Qur'an says about successful people on the Day of Judgment that their faces become white. In chapter 3, verse 106, this does not mean white as a hue of skin. Rather, it refers to light and brightness, which are spiritual descriptions not associated with actual color. A black person can have spiritual light in his face, and a white person can have darkness, and vice versa, depending on one's spiritual and moral condition. Imam al-Ghazali considers ailments of the heart to be part of the Adamic potential. He believes one is obliged to know this about human nature in order to be protected. Other scholars simply consider these ailments to be predominant in man, that is, most people have these qualities, but not necessarily everybody. It is interesting that Imam Maulud says it is impossible to rid oneself of these diseases completely. This implies that purification is a lifelong process, not something that is applied once and then forgotten. Purity of heart never survives a passive relationship. One must always guard his or her heart. There is a well-known hadith which states that every child is born in the state of fitrah. Many Muslims translate this into English as every child is born a Muslim. However, the hadith says fitrah, which means that people are born inclined to faith with an intuitive awareness of divine purpose and a nature built to receive the prophetic message. What remains then is to nurture one's fitrah and cultivate this inclination to faith and purity of heart. So alhamdulillah. That is the uh, section on introduction to purification that we just finished down. Are there any questions? Yes. Hmm. That's a very good question. Jazakallah khairan. So uh, just for those who are watching, the sister was asking about how um, in the modern context we're often, you know, focusing a lot on the mind and thinking and the intellect as a, as a mental process. But then in our tradition, we always focus on the spiritual heart, right? The, 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 so how is there a connection? So if you look at the beginning of the book, I don't remember the exact page, but in the translator's introduction, um, there's a, a whole discussion on this. It's really fascinating where Sheikh Hamza actually talks about the connection that there are in fact neurons, right, in the heart, right? So that there is a communication between the mind and the heart, right? And so um, the, it, it kind of, he's bringing in all of these more modern ideas together to show the relevancy that in fact, the heart and the mind are communicating, and there is a, a deep connection there. Um, so I would definitely say read that. Yeah, of course. Yeah, if you, if you read it, he does obviously a much better job explaining it. But uh, I can read one section here. He says here, the dominant theory states that the central nervous system is what controls the entire human being with the brain as its center. Yet we also know that the nervous system does not initiate the beat of the heart, but, the, but that it is actually self-initiated, or as we would say, initiated by God. We also know that the heart, should all of its connections to the brain be severed, as they are during a during heart transplant, continues to beat. And then he has um, much more commentary on, on the fact that we do have, oh, only recently have we discovered that there are over 40,000 neurons in the heart. So it's a very lengthy, uh, m I mean, much more lengthier discussion, but I would say read that, and it'll, it's very insightful. SubhanAllah. Yeah, but an excellent question. JazakAllah khairan. SubhanAllah. But I, I've always thought about that, too, like, because we hear so much about, you know, the, the heart, and so how is that? So I, I found that really um, enlightening, mashallah. Alhamdulillah. Yes. Mm. Like, like, you know, seeing the Quran, yes. Be honest with yourself and having shame for Allah. Yes. So, like, just admitting to be honest with your neighbor and tell them, um, you're not, like, one of the practices, like, there's, like, confessing 
Mm -hmm. You don't have to be present to help you press things to a person to right. press any kind of like cleansing. Sometimes a teacher, or even just a sister, or someone else can say, like, you know what, you actually right. kind of have this smudge right here. <laughs> you know, like we can, we can be there with each other, but maybe not on a one on one. Mm. So, excellent question, mashallah. So, I, I, again, these are all questions I've even had in the past as well, subhanAllah. But, you know, this idea that, yes, we, in our tradition, we don't have, um, there isn't an emphasis on trying to seek out, um, you know, another human being to confess our sins to. But there is absolutely um, a value in having a guide or a teacher because, like you said, we can be blind to our own uh, faults to our own blemishes, right? And so that's why in our, you know, traditional Islam, there is always a focus on having a guide, a spiritual guide, uh, a spiritual master, someone that you can turn to for that type of heart work to help you to do that heart work. Um, and if you look at, um, you know, Sidi Ahmed Zarruq, who um, who talks about, you know, the in, in his uh, in foundations of the spiritual path, and if you look at you know, the agenda to change our condition, or Sheikh Hamza and Imam Zaid also are talking about how to transform oneself. There, There is always the emphasis that if you can find a spiritual master, look for one, yes. But if you can't, then what do you do, right? What do you do then? And so people have to really, uh, if they are able to seek out a teacher to have that relationship with, that would be ideal. Because, yes, someone who's already on the path, who's been down this road before can certainly help facilitate, you know, it for uh, for you, but also to be able to, you know, see uh, certain things that you don't see, like the hadith, you know, al-mu'min al-mir'at al-mu'min, right? The believer is a mirror for the believer. So to have um, someone who's got the knowledge and has the ability to see in you certain qualities or just to help you along is really important. But it's not always easy to find that person, right? And I think that's the challenge that a lot of people have today because we don't have as much as many scholars or teachers as accessible as previous people, you know, where um, just a few centuries ago you could find masajid and, and teachers and guides everywhere. But nowadays they're very hard to come by. Um, so then the question has been posed, well, what do you do? So our scholars say that, the, in the absence of a spiritual guide to do that for you, um, the salawat would be a spiritual guide. Like the, that, to have the practice of doing at least some say 300 to 500 salawat every day would be as a, I guess, um, you know, would, would uh, be in, re in placement of a scholar for you in that it will start to, you will start to cleanse within, right? As opposed to having someone necessarily point things out to you, the purification process will happen by way of the salawat. So that's kind of, you know, the I think for, for most people today who don't have access, that would be um, the recommendation, is that you just start getting in the habit of doing that salawat, that cleansing process, you know, for, uh, seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through um, that exercise, and then the effect of that would be you're polishing that, that heart, you're polishing it from the disease, and inshallah you'll come out purified. But if you can, of course, it would be best to seek someone who's on the path and um, ask, you know, if they would help you along. Or in even group settings like this, I mean, I think that's like I said, why I've always felt that this was so important, because one-on-one -on -one it might be difficult, but when you come in spaces, right, where we all have a common goal and we're all like helping. And I mean, I've been in so many of these halaqas where you can see and people will come to me afterwards and it's like, um, there's, you know, these light bulb moments that happen, right? These moments of like real realization, these openings, these, uh, what we would call, you know, uh, like there's op spiritual openings that happen even in larger gatherings because you read something, someone says something, someone shares something, and then, subhanAllah, you know, you feel this trans this inner transformation happening. So there are different ways to get there, I guess, but ideally, yes, another person would be 
um, would be ideal. I remember in the very beginning of our studies 20 something years ago, some of the, the sisters and I, we, um, we were doing this work together. I mean, I'm really aging myself, but it was a long time ago uh, and you know, over 20 years ago, right? And we decided, I remember a group of us that we were going to come together just for the sole purpose of telling each other what we thought our diseases were. And I was like, man, we were really <laughs> bold for, for opening up that conversation with each other. I mean, it definitely bonded us because it's not easy to hear, right? So what do you think my diseases are? We, that was the prompt. So what do you think my problems are? What do you think my diseases of the heart are? And then you have someone else like, well, <laughs> and you know that's not going to go well. <laughs> The nafs is really, um, it, it hurts. It hurts to hear that, right? But it was like insightful. I remember a very good friend of mine, she told me something that to this day, I will not forget it. She said, your problem is, is you think you can control things. Um, and it was insightful because, you know, I, I never thought of myself as a controlling person, but I think what she was trying to help me see is that you need to let go. You know, don't think that you can control outcomes. Because like when you're a, if you have like a fixer mindset, you know, like I'm a fixer mindset. So I'm thinking always like, oh, if you do this, this should happen, right? So you kind of get in this very logical, you know, mindset where you think you, you have the answers to things. But she pointed that out to me and it was very, de done very delicately, but it was, it was always something that I reflected on. Like that's, I didn't think that about myself. I didn't know that, but she was watching and witness, you know, Kind of picking up on certain things and alhamdulillah it benefited me because i realized she's right i no matter what you do you cannot control outcomes you know we could all conspire together and have the best plan but if allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want it there's no way it's going to happen you know and that's a i think a really good spiritual lesson to learn so that's the benefit of having good company and good sahba teachers if you can have them is that they will because um, there's direct nasiha, you know, there's direct, like what, what we did, but there's also indirect, you know, knowledge of being transmitted, indirect nasiha being transmitted, um, you know, that that you'll pick up on, just really subtle things, because people have, the most, I mean, mashallah, I've been very blessed to be with really amazing sisters and, and also some of our male teachers and brothers, and I've always found one of the consistent things is the best teachers that I found don't come right out and directly correct you. They won't like make you feel the embarrassment of what you're doing, right? But they will indirectly very like nudge you in the right direction in a very gentle way. And then later you'll be like, oh, I know what they were doing. <laughs> I, I see what they meant to do, you know? Yes. Yeah. It's a very good question. And I think all mothers, we can relate to that. We all have had those conversations within ourselves. I think, you know, um, in my experience, I found that when we focus on the behavior that we want to have, right, which is like to be really, to not do certain things, we might be overlooking the source of why we do it in the first place. And to me, that's more of the focus, right? Why do you have a meltdown in the first place? Why do you lose your cool in the first place? Because if you can get to the root issue, right, and source that and then resolve that, I feel like then you don't have to worry about the outcome. The rest will kind of follow through. But what we tend to do is just, because we feel so guilty, it's a very guilt-driven impulse, right? Be like, I'm never gonna yell at my children because we feel bad. But if you, for example, and I've, I've mentioned this before, but I think it's worth mentioning. Like, I, because I had to do this for myself. I, I, st I, when I, my kids were small, I was like, and I told my husband, I'm like, there are times where I feel like I'm losing control of myself, and I don't like that feeling because I tried to be very controlled, like with my emotions, with my words. I, I try to be controlled. So I said, when I feel that wave of like, 
you know, frustration building up. It's like welling up within me. You know, I need you to support me and know, right, to how to support me. So for example, and I'm totally, you know, putting it all out there now, but like <laughs> in my family, my husband does, has always done the nighttime routine for my the kids, right? Ever since they were young. He just, that was his thing. He wants to do their duas, put them to bed. I'm like, that's fine, good. I've been with them all day, please <laughs> take them. But there was a point where he kind of got a little loosey-goosey, you know what I mean? Where like, it was way past their bedtime, way late. And then, you know how it goes. I mean, I have two boys. It's not a very busy, like loud household, but they're still rambunctious at times. So around 10 or 9.30, when it's my time, because I always tell him nights are mine. I need my quiet time. I need peace. I need to I have certain things I want to get done. I don't want to hear noise. I don't want to hear running around. I don't want to hear fighting in the bathroom. I don't want to hear none of it, you know? So I told him, I said, if I find that my nights are being encroached on or like, you know, you're taking my time, I'm going to start. And I feel, and so I said, if you hear me one time say, because I'll call his name, Hyder, <laughs> like, why are the boys still awake? Why are they still up? Like, that's your cue to know what to do. Then please take care of it, like nip it in the bud, because next time it's not going to be pretty, you know. <laughs> so I had to kind of give him all these guides to pay attention to my cues, you know. And once, like even with my boys, when I started letting them know, pay attention to my tone, pay attention to how I'm speaking, because I don't yell. I, I really try not to yell in my house, but I have. We all, you know, I think lose it, and I hate when I yell, because then I get frustrated and I say I don't. It's like a rule I have for myself that I broke, but I didn't break it because I wanted to. I broke it because no one's listening to me. <laughs> so once I kind of communicated my needs and I feel like I really sourced the issue, which is, you know, the nights need to be controlled better and I need to have more, reg like more, you know, things just handled better. I feel like it got better, right, from that point forward. Um, but if you don't speak up to the source, I feel like then you're just going to keep, you know, each each time it's going to, you're going to keep losing it. And then you, you're the one that sits with that guilt and you keep beating yourself up. And it's just this vicious cycle. So maybe for all of us, if this applies, to try to figure out what is your trigger? Is it the noise level that bothers you? Are they disobeying a direct request? Okay, and then that's the next question, why? You know, because I feel like if you can get to why are they disobeying even that, like what is it, what agreement can we come up with? Um, and even for my kids, for those who are parents, I think it's really important to teach your kids the art of negotiation. Like I, I went with, I taught my kids, I said, we need to, you need to learn to negotiate, which means if I have a request and you have a problem with that request and you have to convince me, you know, but I want this to be a mutually beneficial exchange, not just like giving a command and that's it. Because I feel like kids will respect your wishes much more if you empower them to negotiate terms, right? And if you can do that and teach them to do that, I feel like you won't have the struggle of why aren't you listening to me as much? I don't know, that's just my philosophy, but I hope that answers or helps, yeah. It's, it's difficult, but don't beat yourself up. And also pay attention to your cycle because we're, it's real. Our cycles absolutely impact us. I feel like we have to do a much better job as women to advocate for ourselves if that's, if your hormones are, are part of it. Like if you know yourself that you get much more ag irritable and agitated around that time, advocate for yourself. Like my kids know, I have, I have a run a household of boys, so they know it is my time or it's about to be my time, you better stay away. You know, I give them warnings. And I think they appreciate it because they know. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
until my actual moment of pain. So trying to get to people where they can open up and listen to the body and the body vibration mm-hmm. and then bring it back to me and show me it has me in my um, sort of regular kind of mindset um, is pretty much what not only what I'm doing triggers but what I'm doing to get out of that situation that I'm in. Mm-hmm. That's an excellent point. I do think it's really important to mention like the different stages because your your son is how old now? Yeah, see, so when they're younger, it's like a different type of, right, mom guilt that we have. And then when they get into the teenagers, it's like a, it evolves into something very different. But it's a really great perspective because I think for parents of younger kids, that ability to be self-accountable, to realize like I'm the adult, right, they're younger, I need to model good behavior is really good, like you said, for the purification process. And then as they grow older, it is, I think, um, kind of doing that, um, just sourcing how we can communicate better, right? Because I feel like, you know, the, you're now dealing with many adults. They, they learn to talk back more. And, you're, and you don't, yeah, it's, it's just a different set of uh, variables. But I think... But in both cases, I always try to tell women, be gentle with yourself, because I don't think, unless, you know, a woman really has some anger management issues and real problems, I think most moms, we really try our best to give love and to be the best versions of ourselves, but we lose it because something else isn't being supported or we don't, we, we don't feel supported in, in some other part and uh, maybe trying to figure that out, inshallah. Yeah. Yes, Melanie, please. But uh, I went to the library during the week and I went to a lot of them and um, I interact with a lot of the parents um, and also trying to feel fun out of myself and allow myself to maybe just come out to a week now too. But I think I'm loving now in a certain way is um, bringing everybody in the household with me and I'm kind of teaching the children and the parents and the grandparents and everyone who is in the house kind of like, hey, I'm going on this journey. This is kind of what purification of the heart is. These are the, I don't know, signs and symptoms. Right. And, you know, the next few months we're going to have conversations about this. And I don't know, I find it kind of helpful because what I do is my chakra and I, I, I can have that conversation later. Mm-hmm. Like, kind of sit down. Like, hey, I lost my temper. I apologize. I should have done A, B, and C. And, you know, you just, whatever. You can have an open ended conversation with me. And, um, I was a teenager pretty recently ago, you know, kind of, but like if I have that opportunity, or if I saw my parents come to me and be like, hey, I'm sorry I lost my temper, or hey, I'm so sorry, you know, I, you know, whatever it was that was teeny or working on her, how do you communicate as an adult that way, right? Like, I don't know. So that's how you find a way around a conflict in a relationship when you know you're having a conflict. No, it's very helpful, and it's excellent, excellent advice, I think, really, really relevant to bring your family members into whatever you're working on, because language is effective, right? So if you have a shared language around these topics, um, which is what you're speaking about, and also even temperaments, like understanding your temperament and, and understanding your children's temperaments is really helpful, because what it does is it validates, right, everybody, like... Um, we're all on equal playing field, right? And that's why I love this topic for children too, because it humanizes them, it humanizes us. And like you said, as an adult, I can tell them, yeah, I've got this disease and mom is working on this and I need your duas and I need your support and please make it easy for me. And we can kind of all do it, like you said, together. And so it's very excellent. And I had a good reminder for all of us that whenever when, when we're dealing with our family, whether it's spouses, parents, children, to not um, individualize some of these things. Like there's certain things like prayer, dua, but I think when it has to do with real, um, you know, like a process like this where you're trying to become a better version of yourself and really trying to, you know, embrace a new, like all these virtues and character qualities that you want, you should want to be including, you know, your family in that process. Um, So it's a very, very good reminder. Jazakallah khairan, mashallah. Yes, how many? Well, yeah, I'm sorry, I say yes. Um, so I don't think I had like any intention to ask you about this topic, but I just thought of it when you were just kind of talking. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess I'm trying to think of like maybe like a situation that I could be like in my relationship with my parents where I would feel some kind of like, hey, you know, this is how I'm feeling. 
Yeah, in a marital context, because in a or with because in a marital context, I found, I really think we have to. I mean, I know the language now is so bizarre around gender and and the differences between men and women, and I don't. I'm not even gonna go there, but I feel like we've got to come back to reality and realize that there are differences between the way men and women process information, and a lot of times men, um, they don't retain some of these you know, cues and, and guides that we give them because they're visual learners oftentimes. And also we have like these emotional attachments we make to some of these conversations. So we're very emotionally involved. Whereas with men, it's information, right? So it's like, if you're trying to give information, you know, or, or like relay something to your, to a spouse, then kind of understand it from his lens, which is, this is information. And how do you ex best, um, retain information, especially if he's juggling a full-time job and he's got all these other things going on, sometimes visually. So like a calendar would maybe would be helpful, right? Which is like, these are the days where I need this time off or please, or my, you know, my cycle is coming on this. I'm just letting you know ahead of time because that is information, right? But if just thinking like, oh, I told you, you should know, um, and then be in tune with me and be sensitive to me next month and the month after and the month after. No, 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 no. You're setting a poor man up to fail. Trust me, I've done it. It doesn't work. But when you give them a, like ahead of time or like, like I said, even there's apps now where you can share like, okay, I'm just letting you know this is the next week, you know, <laughs> be forewarned <laughs> and you know the drill. And then you can even make a wish list of things that you request and just send it like a text message. You know, here's my wish list for this month, you know, and that way it's information and they can process information much better than the song and dance that I think a lot of women do, which is like, how could you forget? And then we get all like emotional and then they're like, what, what happened? You were fine yesterday and now, you know, you're not talking to me. I'm out in you know, the cold. So because we, we, we put too much expectation on them to be in tune with us the way like a girlfriend would, right? Like your friend or your sister because we're so emotionally connected, we may empathize and because we have the same context, we can feel, right? Um, but men have a very different, you know, process. So I think just understanding those differences will help. Yeah, I'll have been enough. But excellent questions and, and comments, you guys, mashallah. Yes, assalamu alaikum. Mashallah. That's a very good question. So some, I think women in general, we are conditioned to deflect compliments and praise because many of our cultures and even families may have taught us that you're being arrogant, you're being conceited if you take a compliment, if you, um, you know, take ownership of something, like who do you think you are? And so we don't want that negative association, so we just kind of, eh. But there is a healthy balance, and the best way is to recognize that when someone is giving you a compliment, to don't deflect it entirely, but redirect it, right, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because whatever good you have is from Allah. We weren't born with anything like virtue of our own, right? It's all from Allah. So if a coworker recognizes um, some work of yours, just like, thank you very much. But in your heart of hearts, like, alhamdulillah wa shukulillah. Don't let it seep into the heart where now you think like, oh, I'm so amazing because my coworkers, you know, gave me some recognition. But in your heart of hearts, recognize that it's all by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you have tawfiq, that you have success, that you have the family, the upbringing, the opportunity, the means to be able to do whatever you've done, the skill set, the faculties. It's all from Allah. And to be able to just redirect that praise to him is a healthy way to still accept it so that you don't um, belittle yourself, right? You never want to belittle yourself. And also in a, in a professional context too, that might harm your career, right? Um, and a lot of, I mean, there's entire books written, especially on women and how they don't advance because of this tendency. So it does in many ways harm us. But if we can learn to accept it in the moment, 
without making this big production like oh thank you so much i'm so wonderful but just like thank you graciously accept it but then in your heart of hearts alhamdulillah ya allah thank you so much shukr and that's that's a good way to stay balanced yes okay alhamdulillah thank you jazakallah khairan so we are going to stop for maghrib prayer and then we'll be back here for the shahada inshallah all right, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya wa al-mursaleen, Sayyidina wa Mawlana wa Habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa ala alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome everyone, alhamdulillah. We are so honored and excited tonight to be able to host yet another shahada here at MCC. I've lost count, to be honest, of how many we've had. MashaAllah, tabarakallah, may Allah keep continuing to increase them. And we have one, uh, or more than one, every single day, inshallah. But we're very honored to have our dear brother, our young uh, congregant brother, Yasin here, who I was just informed. This is his second, uh, facilitating his second shahada this month. So our young congregant Yasin has, mashallah, is doing the hard work. Uh, he's out there and he's doing this hard work and he's, mashallah, reaching the hearts. He's brought his dear, I think, best friend or close friend, Romeo, today. And I'm going to pass the mic on because apparently they have an incredible story that I'm really eager to hear. So I'm going to ask Brother Yasin to go ahead. He's also going to facilitate the Shahada, which I love. It's beautiful. They're friends. This is going to be a memory for a lifetime that they will have, inshallah. So, Yasin, please welcome uh, us to, or, or share with us your story. Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum. All right. Assalamu alaikum. Um, so, basically, this story began yesterday, uh, last night, yeah, like around 5 o'clock. Me and uh, I, I decided to call up Romeo. I went to go ask him about something, right? And then the conversation just eventually evolved into, like, life in general and how like today's society there's so many issues you know issues of masculinity how men are not really men nowadays how um the world is just influenced by like uh corrupt people and then slowly over time i just i started to like i told Romeo about islam and how it fixed every single one of these issues 1400 years ago these issues of like uh masculinity i told Romeo about how Right? Yeah, how like it's not Jesus had to be a true Dude, man. Yeah. I like just blew my mind. Yeah, like, yeah. Why? Yeah. So I told Romeo about all that, right? I told Romeo about how you should stop playing video games. Stop. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying? Stop watching all these movies. He's wasting of time, right? And I told him how Islam, it makes you constantly improve every single day. Every single day, you just want to be a better person. Every single day, you want to get closer to Jannah, right? So I just told him about that. I told him how, like, in Islam, the whole, like, concept of it is, like, consistency. You're always consistent. You're consistent with your prayers. You're consistent with your, like, your dhikr, you know? And consistency always, like, leads to success if you know what you're doing. And, and subhanAllah, I told Romeo that he wants to seek the truth. And Romeo, he really did. And I was like, all right, I want you to look at the Quran. And subhanAllah, I showed him a video. And they explained about the mathematical. You want to explain how you felt yeah. about that? Yeah. Yeah. He told me to watch this like 13 minute, minute video that basically explained it. So I watched it. And in a part of the video, it mentioned how basically like everybody that's read the Quran, have, Quran sorry about that, um, they shed tears. And I was like, that's, that's wild. So I, um, I listened to the first 15 verses of it. And... It, it was so crazy. Like, I actually started shedding tears from it. I was like, wait, I don't, I was just mind blown. I was like, I, I'm still like really shocked right now. My bad about that, but it's, it's wild. Yeah, subhanAllah. I showed him the first 15 verses of Surah Baqarah. And it basically talks about how, like, this is the book for those who want guidance, right? And Romeo, you know, he wanted the truth. He wanted to yeah. seek the truth. Unlike the majority of people today, Romeo, like, he honestly, like, wanted to seek guidance. He did not want to reject it. He did not want to, like, waste time, you know? And because of that, subhanAllah, Allah made me the means of him to be guided. You want to explain to you what happened, like, the last couple of weeks of school, you know? Yeah. Yeah, you want to? Okay, so basically, oh, okay, I'll start. Okay. Like, oh, you, you want to start? I got you. All right, bro, this is, I'm getting, bro, I'm nervous. <laughs> I'm super, <laughs> yeah. 
So like what happened was, Wallahi, you know, I just, I felt really bad that I knew about Islam. I felt really bad about like my non-Muslim friends, how they don't understand it. They don't get it. And it like, it, Wallahi, it broke my heart, right? So like, I remember sometimes at night I prayed to Hajjid prayer, right? And I, and I would always ask Allah to do it, you know, I'm just asking Allah, you know, guide my friends, guide them to the truth, guide them, make them see the truth. And then SubhanAllah, you know, Romeo had this, yeah, like, like, out of nowhere, like, I just started thinking about, like, the truth more, and, um, um, I don't, I don't even know how to explain it, like, it was just, it was just weird, like, um, I was just living my normal life, and, like, one, like, the middle of the day, randomly, I was, I just started thinking really deep, and I was, like, I don't, I don't, I want to start, like, working, I want to start, like, making my days more productive, I don't want to just, like, kind of do nothing most of the time. Like, I was starting to get tired of doing nothing, you know? Yeah, I was, I was just like, I was just like, Romy, I felt bored of life, you know? I've always felt like there was something even more out there, more and more greater than me. And then, subhanAllah, you know, like, uh, me and Romy, I was just connected. And by the way, we hadn't, at that time, like, when school ended, right? Like, in, like, what, May, June 1st? We hadn't speak, to, I haven't spoke to Romeo since, like, yesterday, in, like, a month's time. And then immediately me and him clicked right away, right? It was just out of nowhere. Too. Yeah, out of nowhere. We had like a deep discussion for like three hours, right? Just talking yeah. back and forth. Well, I, I can't remember everything, but like it was just so mind blowing, man. Like, you know, subhanAllah. You know? Like, you know, when I keep going. Yeah, it was um, that conversation. It was also really nice to connect with him for all the things we were talking about because there's only like, one other person that I'm actually friends with that I'm actually able to speak about, um, you know, like society and like just a lot of deep things. And um, it was it was just like a really nice conversation, like really nice, mind-blowing conversation. Yeah, you know, because like, again, majority of our age group, you know, yeah. they're just like, they don't, they're not men, you know? They're not true men, you know? They don't think... They don't want to use their brains. They're just, they just want to play on their PlayStation all day. They don't care about knowledge. And subhanAllah, if you just, like, let them go outside, you can see, like, the beautiful world. Instead of that, you know, they'd rather, like, stay home, waste their time on, like, Netflix, movies, nothing that benefits them. And when I realized this, like, it really, like, it just killed my, it killed my hopes for, like, you know, I, I just, I hated it. I was wasting time. It, it was just, it was killing me, and I hated it so much. And I wanted to see truth. I wanted to seek knowledge. And then, like, well, I, you know, like, after that, I just started learning more and more about Islam. I started learning about the masculinity and the manhood of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and how he's, like, the perfect role model, right? Yeah, I was yeah. telling him about him, and subhanAllah, you know? Yeah, and you want to explain how the miracle of the Quran, how Muhammad could not read or write, you know, salt or something? Yeah. <laughs> really uh, oh, my bad. <laughs> so, remember I was talking on the dinner table? How like how shocked you were that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he could not read or write, but he came yeah. out with something like the Quran. Yeah. When he was when um when he was telling me this yesterday about that, I I <laughs> dude, I'm like still kind of speechless on it. But yeah, that that was literally my reaction. I was just I was just speechless. Like I didn't know what to I didn't know what to say like at all. I was just speechless. Like I still am a little speechless right now. Yeah. Like, kind of like, my bad for that. But um, it was just, yeah, like I said, it was a really nice conversation. And it made me want to, you know, learn more about this. And I want to, um, every night, actually, I was going to listen to, I'm going to listen to 15 verses of the Quran every night. And I already did one yesterday, so. You know, alhamdulillah, you know, like, like it's like the only one message I just want to give to people out there is like, you know, what Brother Munir said that Muslims are like the biggest criminals out there because like we have the truth, we have the knowledge, but like a bunch of us, especially the youth, they're like ashamed of it. They're ashamed to go pray. They're ashamed to say I'm a Muslim. They're ashamed to grow the beard. They're ashamed to like do anything. And then like, you know, lie and sad, you know, like the hijabis, they refuse to wear hijab and Muslim men, they refuse to pray. They refuse to like to do anything because they're embarrassed. They have this inferiority complex. They think like, you know, that we're lesser than like uh, these you know, non-Muslims, which is completely wrong. 
like, because we have the truth, you know, like, we're being criminals here. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, like, you know, when on Arafah, he, he placed a trust amongst us, right, that every single one of us become da'is, that every single one of us spread the message of Islam, because we all have that capability, you know, like, Allah, you know, if it, was, if it wasn't me, like, if, if it was any other Muslims, Romeo would have came to the same conclusion. That's the beauty of Islam. But, like, most of us, like, we just refuse. We are just embarrassed. And, like, it's, it's, it's sad because, you know, Allah, we have the truth, you know? Like, why do we not want to spread the truth? Why are we embarrassed by it? Why are we, like, you know, lying to ourselves, you know? It's messed up, you know? So, would you like to add anything? Or? Um, I'd like to talk about this morning. Okay, yeah, go ahead. So, last night, um, I couldn't really sleep for a minute because um, off, of, off of everything that he told me yesterday, I was still, like, just really just mind-blown. Like, I, I literally just couldn't go to sleep. Like, I, I had so much energy for no reason. <laughs> and I was just so shook. Like, I, I, I couldn't go to sleep. So, I think I ended up going to sleep at, like, 1 o'clock. <laughs> and I woke up at 6 so I didn't, I didn't get, like, too much. I didn't get, like, too good sleep. Like, usually I get, like, around, like, eight or nine hours of sleep, um, you know, because I try to get good hours of sleep. But this morning, I woke up, like, like, I've never had that good of sleep in, like, weeks. No, no, not weeks, months. Like, like it was actually mind-blowing. And then, and then he called me, and then he was like, how do you feel? I was like, dude, I haven't had this good of sleep in a while. Like, what? And then he was like, yeah, that was like the same thing for me. Like I had like two hours of sleep and I still felt like I just, I just slept really good. And I was like, dude, that's yeah. like, it's, I'm shook. Yeah. <laughs> like, like he really, we really experienced the same thing. Like it's, it's so, it's, yeah. it's wild. It really is, you know. <laughs> and so, yeah. Yeah, another another thing. My bad. Another thing I'd like to add on with that is, um, even when I did wake up, like I didn't I didn't want to like do what I normally did. Like I didn't want to like just hang out or do nothing at my house. Like I actually wanted to be productive with my day. So that's what I was doing. I was being productive, and like I was enjoying it. Like it was, dude. I've never enjoyed, <laughs> like. Yeah. Like, not to come off lazy yeah, yeah, or anything. Yeah, I got that, like, I got that, yeah. That's like, like most like, of us, right? Doing right. work like that hasn't been too enjoyable like yeah. that. But, like, this was the first time, like, I actually really enjoyed working, mm. which was yeah. wild. Yeah, for, uh, yeah, it's the same for me, you know? Because, like, with the whole prayer thing, I was like, I'm, uh, I'll, I'll admit this. I was not really the most practicing Muslim until, like, recently, December, right? And I figured it out. Like, when I started praying my five prayers, when I started being more consistent, with Islam, and I started improving myself. A lot, like, I love working now, you know? It's very easy for me, alhamdulillah, to just, like, just to be productive. And now I just, for some reason, I hate this, I have this hatred of just wasting time. I have this hatred of just sitting there and doing nothing, right? Yeah, it's just so boring. Like, I can't stand it. Like, you know, I always got to improve. I always got to gain knowledge. I always got to do something, you know? And it's, yeah. Yeah, um, like, uh, today... My friends asked if they could hang out with me, so I was like, sure. So I invited them to my house, and we were hanging out for like a good two hours, and I was like, I literally just looked at all my friends, I was like, dude, like, we're not doing anything, y'all can just like go right now, I'm not gonna lie, because I, <laughs> like, I, I started getting a headache, because they were just, I mean, they were having a good time, and I was sitting there like, dude, we're doing nothing, like, I don't want to do nothing, like, y'all can just go right now, so... <laughs> yeah. Just see that? Yes. I don't know. So, if you want to, would you like to say anything else? Or are you ready? I'm ready. You ready? I don't know what I'm ready for, but I'm ready okay. for it. <laughs> so, let me explain to you what the Shahada is. So, the Shahada is basically a declaration of faith. You're telling all these people now that I'm a Muslim. And once you say these words, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, it's the greatest, well, I'll slow it down for you, don't worry. It's the greatest, it's the greatest, one of the greatest statements of all time. Because, you know, like, like the word La ilaha illallah, there's no God worthy of worship except Allah, that is so powerful, you know? Like, that could honestly, like, save you from, like, hell. Yeah, like, legit, there'll be a man on the Yom Al Qiyamah, on the Day of Judgment, right? He'll have all these sins, 
and he'll be like, oh man, he's thinking to himself, I'm gonna go to hell, right? And then there'll be one card that says, la ilaha illallah, and it'll be put on his good deeds, right? And you know what happened? All his bad deeds, his mountains of bad deeds dropped immediately because of that one statement alone. And because of that, he went to Jannah, bro, to heaven. Like, yeah, that's how powerful that statement is. And it's so powerful, in fact, that after once you say it, you're like a new Muslim, you're like brand new, you're like a newborn baby. Every single thing that you did, I don't care how bad it was, no sins, any sin, bro, it's forgiven immediately. Yeah, so that's... So prepare yourself, man. All right. All okay. Right, so it's a simple you. statement, bro. No All pressure, right. you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Ashadu. Repeat after me. Ashadu. Ashadu. La, la, ilaha, ilaha, in Allah. In Allah. In Allah. Allah. Wa ashadu. Wa ashadu. Anna. Anna. Muhammadah. Muhammadah. Abduhu. Ab. Abdu, Abduhu, Abdulu, Wara, Wa, Wara, Rasulu, Rasulu. Yeah, okay, you got it. All right, my bad. That's all it's good. No, that's fine, it's fine. Okay, I'm gonna say it in English now. You're gonna repeat after me. Okay. I bear witness. I bear witness that there is no deity, that there is no God, that that. <laughs> no, wait. Would you say that the, deity? That, deity? Yeah. Okay. That, that there is no, no. That there is no deity. I'm sorry. I Microphone. Worthy of worship. Worthy of worship. Except Allah. Except Allah. And I bear witness. And I bear witness. That Muhammad. That Muhammad. Is the servant. Is the servant. A messenger of Allah. A messenger of Allah. Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. Takbir, you know. Allahu Akbar, you know. Now you're a Muslim. Every single thing you just did is forgiven, you know. That's wild. <laughs> That's yeah, man. So, it's like, mashallah, man. So, inshallah, uh, I'll teach you how to. I'll teach you the Fatiha, the first chapter of the Quran, and then uh, I'll teach you how to pray today, right. inshallah. Yeah. And uh, I got you said uh, Munir has like the box, right? Yeah. So Munir has like the Muslim box, and he'll, he'll teach you. He'll he'll help you out. We have Muslim programs out there. Okay. Uh, so don't worry, man. Don't feel overwhelmed. Just take it one step at a time. All right. All right. All right. Oh no no it's fine it's fine it's in the it's in it's in your office it's yeah okay my bad <laughs> but, so when he's bringing that up so I, you want to tell us how you feel like dude <laughs> like that conversation last night was actually so mind blowing yeah like not and especially coming here like I felt so welcome into this. Mm -hmm. Like, um, like I appreciate the dinner. Yeah, no problem. Bro. No. And yeah, bro, I got you, man. Anytime. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Oh no, you know. Oh, no, you don't have to. Uh, okay, so like when new Muslims convert to Islam, some of them they choose a Muslim name, but you don't have to choose a Muslim. It's, it's you know. Oh okay. Yeah, it's fine. You can keep Romeo if you like, but you know. All right, then, okay, all right, so, inshallah, so, I'll start you off. This is your prayer, man, mashallah, you know? So, yeah. when we pray five times a day, we face Mecca, right? You know, the black cube, the Kaaba, right? Yeah. We face that direction, and then we pray, right? And then, inshallah, bro, we got you a bunch of books, right? By Hamza Yusuf. Purification of the heart. Yeah, yes, yeah, right. sir, right? So, like, it's by Hamza Yusuf. He's a famous... Uh, Muslim preacher, you know, everyone knows him. He sometimes comes here, right? So then I'll get, leave that book right here. Um, you know, and then we have this book, the book of assistance for new Muslims. This is going to help you out a lot. Right. I'm going to tell you right now, for a long time, you're going to be, you might feel lonely, but just trust me, these books are going to be like your best friends, bro. Trust All right. Me. All right. The next book is um, this, Being a Muslim, a Practical Guide. It's going to help you out. Trust me, like, okay. a lot is going to do. All right. And this is the greatest book of all time. The Quran. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right? Yeah. So this is the Quran. And it's, oh, mashallah, it's even with the last sermon. Um, so, like, it's the English translation. You can take that. Be careful with it. It's the word of Allah directly, right? Yeah. It's, like, one of the, it's the greatest book of all time. There's going to be nothing like this book until the day of judgment. There'll be nothing. 
so right. just take care of it. Um, you know, read it, and uh, trust me. Any any questions you have, any stressful situation that you're gonna have, you're gonna find it in this book. Yeah. Eventually, yeah, you just gotta read it. You know, okay. you gotta think over it. But yeah. So this is this is your uh, new Muslim guy, Alhamdulillah. I appreciate it. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, anytime. <laughs> So again, don't feel overwhelmed. We're gonna take this baby steps, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so.